Michael Fairbrother joins me this week to talk about making cider. This is Beersmith Podcast number 263. This is Beersmith Podcast number 263, and it's mid-August 2022. Michael Ferrybrother joins me this week to talk about making cider. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brewhouse controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And I launched a new version of the Beersmith Forum this week, as well as made some significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and of course, our Beersmith recipe software. Join the conversation today at beersmith.com slash form. Again, that's beersmith.com slash form. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Michael Fairbrother. Michael is founder and head mead maker at Moonlight Meadery. Moonlight Meadery has won medals at the Mazer Cup every year they've entered. And Michael also produces commercial ciders, which we're going to chat about today. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Brad. How about yourself? I'm good. It's uh, it's a beautiful day here in Northern Virginia. And uh, I think up, up where you are, too, you said you could see like 40 miles. Yeah, we got um, our new farmstead has a panoramic mountain views at least 45 miles uh, in all directions. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, I did I did miss you at Homebrew Con this year, but I think you were tied up uh, with your new... Uh, it's called Over the Moon Homestead location, which is where you're coming from now. Uh, Over the Moon Farmstead. Farmstead, okay. Yeah, we um, we bought this 259 year old uh, farmstead. It's almost 100 acres. Um, it's a lot of pastoral farmland, so we have hay being commercially produced on the property. We got eight apple trees, blueberry bushes, raspberry bushes, and beehives. Now uh, we've got our brewery up and running. We're working on a restaurant space. It's uh, I'm trying to build a destination location for New Hampshire for for beer fans, mead fans, and cider fans. And that's a that's a little distance from your old location, right? Yeah, it's about 40 minutes uh, further, a little bit north and east of our previous location, but it's only 13 miles from the state capital. So we're pretty confident with the lakes region that we're now in, and the now tourists that are up here that we're we're making a much better move. And where where are you located exactly? Pittsfield, New Hampshire. Ah, excellent. And um, uh, what you know, what prompted you to dive into the new location? Well, we've been looking for a place to really kind of, you know, our tagline has always been romance by the glass, but a warehouse is not really the most romantic place in the world to go sample mead. <laughs> uh, so we've been looking for for this this you know my dream location for twelve years now, and um, found it on October fourth of twenty twenty. And um, I, I woke my wife up, didn't even offer her coffee. I said, we got to go see this property. And she's kind of trying to figure out what I was talking about. And, and I finally get her coffee and, and we head on up. And we didn't have a real estate agent. We didn't have a banker or anything. And because uh, I've been really sinking almost everything I've ever made back into the company, trying right. to make sure that right. you know, we got long-term success. And so, you know, the real estate agent got back to her and said, well, we can't show you the property today, maybe Thursday. But my, my brother had sold his house the previous weekend for close to $80,000 over asking price. And I wasn't about to wait on something I saw and, and just looked perfect from my perspective. So we drove up, parked along the road, didn't even get on the property, but walked past the house, taking pictures and walked back up. And there's a full functional pick your own apple orchard across the street. Walked into that location and met the owner and and talked to him about my dreams about buying this property. And a couple of days later, I had a purchase and sales agreement in place, and it took us till February to buy the property. Uh, it was pretty run down. There was a eight stall barn that's now our gift shop and tasting room. We've converted the 
say, 185-year-old barn into the, the main open concept kitchen. Pizza ovens arrived, so we're just now starting to work on chef menu development and everything else. But we started our brewery. We have a one-barrel nano brewery on property right now, so we're making all our own beer. Um, we still make our mead and cider down in our Londonderry location, and um, but we pretty much share everything we make in Londonderry up here to Pittsfield. So customers that know and love my mead can come have it here. And, you know, if they want to go for a hike in the back trails or we have a metal detecting weekend coming up uh, on Saturday. So it, it's just, you know, there's so much culture and history here. It's, it's hard not to want to share it with as many as my fans as possible. So, Michael, how did you decide to get into uh, brewing? Because I know you really uh, were not a big brewer, brewer uh, I know, although I know you homebrewed for a while, right? Yeah, so uh, beer making, cider making, and mead making uh, from an home, amateur homebrewer level, uh, almost, what's 20, 27 years now? Right. Maybe, maybe 28. So I've, I've always loved great beer. Um, I've been all over the world to go travel to breweries and such. And I always wanted to have my own brewery, but I thought, you know, having a brewery means you have to have an exceptional skill set. And, you know, my my exceptional skill set is more mead making, cider making than in, than brewing. Uh, hard for me to admit that, but uh, I still think I'm a, a really good brewer, but good is not good enough. So I hired Michael Robinson, who won the 2009 um, Samuel Adams uh, long shot competition. So Michael and I go back well over 20 years of brewing together. Oh, and wow. there was the day where we were in his backyard talking about someday we might open a, a brewery together. And, you know, here we are. So he's my brewmaster. He's in charge of all, all things beer. Um, you know, I try to keep him focused on, on beer that tastes like beer. Yeah. So we're doing traditional styles. Our tagline for hidden moon brewing is history never tasted so good. So we really want to focus on, you know, the, the beers that, you know, I remember and why I got into beer and not, not that there's anything wrong with fruit bombs and everything, but you know, when I want a, a fruit bomb like my my passion fruit cider, yeah, I, I really um, <laughs> I I really want it in the cider versus in a beer. So, Michael, what uh, what styles are you producing? I know you said they're sort of traditional historical styles. Right, we're um, we're trying not to focus on just IPAs. So we've got an English mild, we have some uh, Belgian golden strongs, uh, we got. American Amber Ale, we've got a oatmeal stout that we just kicked through. Scotch Ale is on draft right now. Uh, we've got what my brewmaster calls a lime craft, which is a Belgian lime. Uh, so it is a fruit bomb, and it's a really tart fruit bomb. But Interesting. Some, some of our customers want those juicy, tart uh, beers, even though it may not be my particular favorite. It's, um, you know, we don't do everything based on my opinion around here. And, um, <laughs> you know, if it sells, it sells. So we, we're trying really hard to, though, to um, put quality and perfection far and above everything else that we do. And um, I think you mentioned that uh, that you're, you're brewing primarily on premises right now. You're not distributing any of the beer yet, right? Yeah, we don't plan on distributing beer. So um, if you were familiar with like the Treehouse and Trillium um, markets or Hill Farmstead, they, sure. they really um, make beer for there. And you know, right now we're at a one barrel system. We're working with our bankers to build up a seven barrel system. But we, we really only want to sell our beer here because trying to fight for that package, the shelf space for packaged beer in the market, it's not worth the effort. It's you know, if if you've seen my my growth in the mead world and see where we're at now, um, you know that that fight for shelf space gets harder and harder every year. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not there working the market or talking to store owners to get that shelf placement, it doesn't matter how much we've sold in the past. It's what's selling now, and you, you know your past performance is no indic indication of your future success. So <laughs> it's um, I can it's a tight space. Huh? Yeah, it's 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 never going to be easy, and it, with a, a hill, you know, with a farmstead like we have with a hundred acres, 
you know, we'll have a hundred person venue restaurant. We've got seating outside for right now about a hundred, but I could, I could look into doing Renaissance fairs here. I mean, a hundred acres, a lot of land yeah, it is. and, um, you know, we could completely park several thousand people on the property and still have plenty of room <laughs> for whether we want to do a, a blues festival or, or just a big mead festival. You know, I, I do own the name meat for your die and, you know, I, I now have a location where we could have a really, really cool meet event. Um, but I got to get some laws changed to allow us to be able to judge such a competition here illegally. And um, it's all work. Well, it sounds like you got some uh, got your work cut out for you. Um, yeah, it's but it's fun, Brad. It's oh, really, absolutely. Yeah, it's the drive of life for me. Yeah. Well, uh, quite a few years back, you started producing cider commercially, which is uh, was our main topic for today. Um, along with your traditional meat offerings, what, what drove you to get into cider? It's just, uh, so I liked New England style, uh, hard cider and it's not really possible to make one legally, um, because they make you classify it as a wine. Um, but that, that New England style cider, which is stronger, um, uh, tastes a lot like a cider, but it's like 13 and a half percent alcohol and, wow. and we come up with a classic name for it, and then we got sued, and we came up with another kind of funny name for it, and then got sued again, and so now we call it thirteen five. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a rye barrel aged cider. So we age it, and um, we now have thirty one hundred gallon or one hundred barrel fooders. So we have two of them. Uh, we sanitize the the fooder with uh, rye whiskey uh, in between uses. So that's how we are legally able to you know, impart that flavor into the wood without adding alcohol to, to our, to our cider. Cause that would be illegal. And, um, you know, it's, it's really been amazing to see how, you know, my mead making skills have translated into cider making skills and, you know, how well received our cider is. It's by far and away our biggest selling product at this point in time. Wow. And, um, and that's, that's kind of crazy to think about from my perspective, because it's, yeah, I think a mead is you know what I'm well known for, but there's a lot more customers who drink my cider than than drink my mead. That's awesome. What uh, what variations of cider do you produce? Is it? I, yeah, I know so, you mentioned the, the the main line one, but yeah, so thirteen five is our our New England high cider. So that's that's something we sell in Trader Joe's all over, and you know we, they deal directly with us here in New Hampshire for that. Um, but then we have Little Apples, which is it's a little cousin, so it's a six and a half percent. Um, just con- new world cider, uh, aged in oak as well. So it's got a nice, light, crisp, refreshing flavor to it. Whereas the thirteen five is is a lot beefier and in, in, you know, go one, go maybe two, but don't yeah. pick a four pack. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's um, I call it you're not your lawn mowing cider. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's 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 really cool. Um, we do do some variations, like we have um, current obsession, which is a black current. Um, honey apple cider. Oh, nice! I um, love black currants. Yeah, and and that can play well either to the beer or beer mead fans or to the cider fans because it's kind of a combo in between. Um, I have a few more. Just came out with a passion fruit cider, so it's like I said. I'll show you how juicy this thing looks. It's it's murky, wow. not filtered. Nice. It smells like fresh passion fruit juice. <laughs> just just absolutely amazing. Seven point eight percent ABV. So still, still pretty stout for a cider, right? Tart, you know, like the tartness, grips the back of your tongue. It's like biting into a fresh, fresh piece of passion fruit. You know, it's just my wife, Bernice is South African and she, she really grew up having a lot of these kind of fruits where it's not really something I had while growing up here in New Hampshire. And, um, yeah, you can see, you can expect to see this coming in our future lineup at some point. We will be featuring it at Seattle Cider Summit uh, coming up in the next month or so in uh, Seattle, Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, they this was pretty much uh, the fruit company offered up the fruit and said, "Hey, make a cider where they want to see what you can do." And if you're going to Seattle Cider Summit, please come try this and you know give us your vote because we'd love to win a medal on the other side of the country. Well, I know most homebrewers have uh, the, the majority of the equipment they need to make cider, but can you walk us through what the cider making process might look like for an average homebrewer? Sure. So you ideally, 
you want to find unpasteurized juice, but you can make cider with pasteurized juice. Um, the What's fresher, the, the better. What would, what would the difference be there then between the pasteurized? So, I mean, I know what the difference is pasteurizing it, but uh, why do you want the unpasteurized juice? Flavor is yeah. it for me is is key. You you get a little different, and so we don't get it sulfided or sorbated. Uh, so it's it's fresh pressed juice. The day they press it, they bring us a tanker trailer truck at a time. But you know, like homebrew clubs that I used to or still belong to, like Brew for Your Die, uh, the Boston Wort Processors, uh, would get together for an annual cider uh, weekend and and have the farms press cider right then and there. Uh, everybody show up with growlers or um, various containers to put the cider in to lug home and mm-hmm. and then you can you know add your yeast to it and and let it go or just let it go with natural yeast there's a lot of variability to cider making so whether you <laughs> whether you want to have something that can get to bone dry and then you're working on back sweetening it or the acidity character from the apple choices matter a lot so i mean it took me a long time and a lot of experimentation with different types of apples different types of blends you know working with heirloom varieties, working with traditional tabletop varieties. You know, there's, there's a lot of good books out there. Paul Carinti's book, and I can't remember because it's probably written 20 years ago now. You know, there's a great book on cider making. Um, there's some newer ones in my collection. I can't remember all the names off the top of my head. But so the cider, the cider process is really – a really easy way for homebrewers to experiment, right? Mm-hmm. And and what I would recommend doing is do one gallon or half gallon batches and play around with different fermentation temperatures, different you know adjuncts that you might want to add. Get your cider to ferment clean, and then you can play around with now what do you want to do to it, right? So here we made this cider with you know our traditional process, aged it in the the oak to get that tannin levels up to where we like. And then we added the, you know, the puree to that cider to get that passion fruit characteristic to it. Mm-hmm. Um, we did start with a pretty strong cider, you know, the 13 and percent alcohol. So by adding the fruit and maybe a little bit more water, we were able to get it down to that 7.8%. But you really have to be careful with, with packaging cider to make sure it's stable. Right. The last thing you want to do is put um, fresh fruit juice into into a finished cider and expect it's not going to continue because it, it is by far and away going to continue to want to ferment and make more carbonation. So you have to be really careful with with how you're t- packaging and treating all this stuff. Mm. I would not recommend adding fruit juice and putting it in a glass bottle with a sealed uh, crimp on cap for it, for example. Yeah, I, I do want to talk about back sweetening in a minute, which I think is part of what you're discussing. But um, walk us through the basic process again. So you're going to start with apple juice, and you're literally just going to pitch yeast into it? Yeah, so the federal government does not consider the word cider a legitimate term to mean unfermented apple juice. So you, you, we start with apple juice, not the clarified kind that you'd find in like Berry Fine or whoever's the grocery store variety, but fresh pressed apples. So it has a lot of pulp, mm-hmm. has a lot of character and color into it. It's usually like a dark brown um, or lightish brown color. And so we'll start with the juice. Um, if we're going to add sweetener to make it stronger, whether it be honey, whether it be natural sugars, uh, we'll do that pre-fermentation. So mm-hmm. I like to try to get most of my... 13, 14% stuff around 32 bricks to start with. So was that like a one? Pretty high. 128. Yeah, 128. So it's, yeah, it's, it's massive. And what, what I try to do then is, you know, we use Lavalin 71B for our yeast. It's the same yeast I use for all my mead making and cider making. Hmm. And, you know, we've occasionally made Lambic style ciders and most of those have happened on accident. Um, but if you control your accidents, you You're can talk about uh, soured, right? <laughs> yeah. So, well, and the pellicle on the top of a, so it's, it's called the cider gets sick. So the pellicle forms on the top and I've got some pretty interesting photos of this moonscape landscape type um, thing going on the top of the label. But, um, and then once it's done being sick, it'll drop 
you know, the, the pellicle drop through the, and it'll get crystal clear. Uh-huh. And then as I learned, it'll get sick again. Oh, and, no. <laughs> and so, you know, another pellicle forms. And then it really, really starts to take, take on some really interesting lambic style characteristics to it. And after, you know, two years of letting it sit in, in plastic with, with it becoming this really funky cider, I then chose to put it inside of one of our oak barrels and let it mature. And I, I actually added some fresher, um, cider to almost make a goose um, style uh-huh. combination. So like you had the older stuff that was really acidic, the lighter stuff coming in to add some sweetness to it and seeing how those flavors and the blending of, of everything could go. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, um, so um, back to regular cider making. So it's about a, you know, traditionally here in New England, they would make their cider in the fall when the apples were available, mm-hmm. and then they'd harvest or rack and gather the barrels closer to the springtime. Now, the barrels could be stored in barns, which would freeze, which would help make them a little bit stronger. Mm. Yeah. But you, you can get, you know, and they, they were traditionally aging them in oak. So the, the, the historical New England farmhouse ciders had a lot of oak tannins to them. Um, there could have been a lot more wild, you know, Mark, um, not cranberry crab apple um, type flavors or apples into them. So, and some of the most prized cider makers, like if you go to Farnham Hill here in New Hampshire, you know, they, they, they make some really excellent cider and that's all they make. And, and they're very low in sugar. So they're, they treating them almost like a champagne um, by the time they're finished with it. So, you know, I've had some good folks that I could lean on and learn from as I was starting this process. And like I said, I used to go to these cider days and, you know, your homebrew clubs are a massive wealth of information, you know, places like Beersmith, um, another great source of, you know, how to how to get the experts to come in and talk about this, you know, trial and error, taste, um, measure your pH so you know what you're dealing with. Sometimes if your cider is finishing at four, four pH, that means that you're not going to stabilize it. So it'll it'll go bad or south or too too high, right? The pH yeah, would be too high. Way too point. high. And then you'd probably need to use um, like malic acid to bring that down to like two, three point two, 3.2 yeah, anywhere. But for, above 4 is almost indefinite amount of sulfites and sorbates. You, can, you can't you can add enough to make it stabilize. But mm. if you lower your pH into that low low threes, then you then you have a way of stabilizing and making something shelf stable that – that'll lay down and last for a long, long time. I mean, I've got ciders in my basement now that are approaching 20 years old wow. and, uh, you know, <laughs> it's hard to remember 20 years ago. I certainly don't keep the most, uh, prestigious notes on some of my homebrew stuff because <laughs> I always like brewing and cider making and mead making as, as like an expression of my art, you know, like an expression of my, I don't, I, yeah, I guess the art, you know, the, like being an artist, right. And, and being able to control all those flavors. And it's really fun for me to watch and see how it changes over time. Now, before I started Moonlight, you know, I took, te- I took pretty good notes, but you know, 12 years ago now, and you know, those notes are long gone, but you know, I really, I think you could, this almost infinite amount of variability to the cider making process and the, and, and how to make something interesting. You know, for the most part, I try not to make a really sweet cider. I think there's sweet ciders already in the marketplace, and that's not a, not a place I want to play in. There's too many sweet ciders now. I want to give mm-hmm. customers something different and more refined, and that's why we use a lot of oak. Well, in actually every cider we make, we use oak. And, um, and you know, the, the barrels, the, the characteristics that the barrels add – over time changes like first few batches not long in the barrel because it was more fresh and you you don't really want to have that oak overpower but now we can lay lay longer and and develop more nuances because it's you know they've been in use for almost i think four or five years now um well what impact do the apples have on the flavor of the cider i i know a lot of the you know commonly grown (laughs) apples these days are not necessarily the best ones for cider making right yeah, that's that's true. Um, you can play around. There's there's ways to accomplish what you want with whatever you have. Um, so whether it's the type of yeast, whether it's the type of apple, um, how do you condition it post? And you know, 
it, all this matters. So we typically use a lot of house blend apples, and most of the New England ciders makers all get their juice from the same producer hmm. or presser up here in New England. So if you think of my cider as being significantly different than, let's say, every other major cider producer here in New Hampshire or New England, we're all buying the juice from the same guy. So really? we, we can <laughs> control the blend, and, and I, I do have a particular blend, but I can tell you that we use a lot of household varietal apples, galas, uh, Macintosh, some Red Delicious, maybe right. a couple of Pippins. But, you know, it's, it's really about that, you know, taste the fresh juice and build the mindset around what's it going to taste now? Like sweet, nice, okay. What am I tasting past the sweetness? Where's the acidity level? Where are the other intrinsics? How sweet is it? You know, what do I have to do to modify it or add sugar or not? Um, how do I want to store it? How long do I want to store it? You know, we're making um, an apple maple mead that we've been aging now for maybe five, six years. Mm -hmm. Um and it's it's not a rush job, right? For me, it's it's about when it's ready. So I want to, you know, it's not quite like beer. Um, it's I, you have longer time, and you got to be careful though. You don't want to introduce oxygen because then it'll get stale. Um, but you you have time to to find the flavor you want, and then build from there. You know, and, and if you're making a a really big apple wine or you know what I call a New England style cider, you know that time helps right it helps to meld the flavors and to get all the pieces together right so they get they get better with age kind of like needs do right can't or say lines. all of them are gonna but yeah they, they they have the opportunity if if made well handled well and and nothing else introduced i mean i certainly didn't expect my cider to um, get a pellicle on that that batch and you know we have used cider from Cider Days, which is a Western Massachusetts um, cider festival. It's, I think, a weekend long or something crazy like that, where top producers from around the uh, country come out to, to bring their ciders. And some of the local orchards out there have heirloom varieties. And so we had six, I think about 30 gallons of cider that year, so six five-gallon batches, mm -hmm. um, just to try different blends and see how they all work. Then I made them into different um, ciders and some of them I didn't add anything to. Some I might have added a little bit of honey to at the end to try to back sweeten. Um, a lot of the heirloom varieties are really tart or in semi uh, semi tart or what do they call it. Um, the tartness level can change pretty significantly between the types of apples. Right. So you know, and again, it's kind of like learning how this color and you know this color work together and this kind of acidity and this kind of apple sweetness work together <laughs> so it's it's really you know the the exceptional cider makers the the delta is so small of what makes you know go from good to exceptional that it's it's really hard to to hit that on a consistent note but that's where trial and error and and really building your knowledge of knowing okay if i get here how do I take that smallest of step to get to where I want it to go to without overreacting and over, you know, overplaying your hand. And, you know, and I, so I paid attention to how Lambic makers work with beer and how they blend and how they may have one barrel and another barrel and they're looking at A and B. And then they think, okay, if we add a little bit more of C, you know, we've got more than the sum of the parts. And, and that's really how I come at cider making too, which is, Yes, I have 100 barrels at a time, so it's 3,100 gallons. Wow. But how, how much am I going to package at any one point in time? And at our, our largest capacity, 400 barrels of cider, we could, we could come out the door with a, at one shot, which that's an awful lot of 16-ounce cans. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I haven't even done the numbers in my head, but yeah, it would probably take me a, an awful long time to figure out how to, to work that market. And, you know, my team and I are pretty small. We're, we're about eight people total in the whole company. And that covers production down in London Dairy, production, you know, brewing here in Pittsfield. Uh, my sales and marketing team is based in California. Yeah, you know, I've got my tasting ambassadors here in the state, my sales guy in the state. So it's, it's really, you know, I don't have a road crew that can go work, go to door to door to every, you know, Kroger or whatever store out there and just try to say, hey, 
we like this, but here's where your customers come in handy. Because <laughs> if there's anybody that has more power than a producer, it's the customer. Right. So customers have all the control. If you ever see a beer that you want, you can't find, ask for it. Same is true with my meads and my ciders. And we used to do a campaign saying, if you can't find my meads, demand it. Right. And, and, you know, I've done a lot of podcasts and I've done a lot of, you know, trying to gorilla market uh, my stuff. And, and, you know, it's not stuff in my mind, it's my love and my passion. But, sure. you know, I've, I've gotten beat up many a times trying to walk into stores and say, yeah, you know, you should carry some of this. People love it. And they go, nobody ever asked for Moonlight. And so we're not going to carry your stuff. And it's, you know, a little disheartening when you see somebody that tries it for the first time. They go, Wow, where has this been my whole life? And <laughs> and proceed to buy you know as many bottles as they can get a hold of. I've seen it yeah. happen firsthand in California and Tennessee. And one of the big challenges I've had is there's so much bad meat out there that it's really hard uh, to get people to into meat when they've had so some have had bad experiences. You know? Yeah, and I agree, and that's why I've helped teach at the Robert Mondavi Institute, and just recently got back from a trip to. Uh, Warsaw, Poland, where I was teaching folks from 38 different meaderies about the balance of, of sweetness and, and the perception of sweetness for meads. And it all goes hand in hand. I mean, we, yeah. the better everybody is at making better stuff, the the better the market's going to do. And, you know, it's, it's needed. Yeah. Um, well, going back to cider for a minute, what are some of the challenges you have uh, making cider other than, I, you know, you already mentioned the sour issue? Yeah, well, it's um, getting it to market. I mean, the, the, certainly with the way the, the economy is going, you know, our sales are down across the country. We see a lot of distributor sales are down. Um, so, you know, the, the adage that people drink where the times are good or bad may not be so true. Uh, so, you know, I'm drinking more if that helps. But, um, you know, it's... Um, the challenge of cider making, good apples. I think, you know, did you did you have an incident a couple of years ago you told me about? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, stabilization is pretty key. Uh, <laughs> we, we lost an awful lot of product due to um, not understanding the cause and effect of some of the things and not being able to do a good root cause analysis. So, yeah, I thought I understood cider making, but I was a mead maker making 14% alcohol meads. And then we dropped to 7.5% or 6.5% ciders, and we were having refermentation issues. Significant, almost put me out of business, wow. um, where we had to recall product. Um, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of cases. And, you know, not having the right insurance is is crucial <laughs> to surviving or right having the right insurance is crucial to surviving such a such a uh, onslaught to your business but um certainly learned fast um and learned hard what we were doing wrong and at ph meters that are defective are no value at all and you have to make sure you test your equipment and you know the things that you think are the most common you know as as my team grew, it wasn't just me making things anymore. So, you know, I had to learn how to manage my team better to help them get the knowledge they needed to make better product. And, you know, we, we've consistently won awards with our, our meads and, and our ciders. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we get invited back to Seattle Cider Week year after year. And it's it's impressive to me to think that I'm one of the few cideries in the whole eastern seaboard of the United States that gets brought to Seattle Cider Week. Um, and it's just because, you know, work ethic, work hard. Hard is not enough, work harder. And Absolutely. Harder, harder <laughs> is not enough. You've got to figure out how to even do it more. Hmm. So it's just, it's it's never ending, you know, and it's, it's gotten me to buy this farmstead. I mean, I never in my dreams thought I'd have a 100 or 269-year-old house with, with antique pine boards and a um, hilltop view that's, 45 miles long and building my restaurant going to build my new meadery and brewery location here on the property and eventually put a wedding and event space here. So, nice. you know, nice. heart is never, never my stopping point. It's, it's, I get bruised, I get dusty, I get up and keep on going. Well, you mentioned the problem you had with stability. Maybe we ought to talk a little bit about back sweetening and stabilizing, uh, which are both very important, not only for meads, but as, as you've shown for ciders. 
Sure. So um, pH is critical. Like I said earlier, if your pH is anywhere near four, it's you, you can't stabilize. It's just not possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so adjusting adjusting your pH with, with malic acid and doing trial batches to make sure you know how much you need to add. How, how do you want to get your pH down and make sure it's it's not too harsh, uh, too acidic? Um, you know, we don't do a lot of you know, trying to adjust the other direction, like where we're too too acidic and we're trying to maybe add some calcium carbonate to soften up the flavor or anything. That's really not my skill set. So I, I try to work with sweetness and, and tartness to, to balance. But then you, you have to have that right balance of pH. And once you have that, then you can run your calculations for how much sulfites and sorbates you need um, to add. It's so anyways, we're, we're talking about sulfites and sorbates, which are used uh, very commonly to, to, to stabilize, you know, not only mead, cider, uh, wines, right? Correct. Yeah. And so do you use those in yours as well? We do. Yeah. So we don't, if we are making organic ciders, um, that wouldn't be possible. So if that's the case, you really have to depend on having all your sugars depleted. Um, otherwise, your opportunity for refermentation. Uh, there is the option of sterile for filtration. Um, we do have a um, cross flow filter that brings it down to 0.2 microns, but it's nominal. Uh, nominal for those may not be paying attention in high school or college means average. Average <laughs> is not good enough for sterile filtration, right? So you could then go through cartridge filters that could um, be sterile. Um, it's a slower process to, to, to do that, and you might have a little more waste. But so it is possible to have a um, product that is no yeast and, and no micro contamination uh, to cause any re fermentation. But um, I have valued that it's not worth that risk um, based on the size of our company now and, and trying to have a shelf stable product because you, you, the last thing you want if you ever go pro is have customers calling up and saying, well, we gave it a try, but it blew up on the shelf, and now we want you to take it all back and never want to hear from you again. <laughs> yeah, I, I worked in the space business, and uh, we like to keep, th- keep things nominal as well, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> have you, uh, I, 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 hand in hand with stabilization, though, you can do something called back sweetening, which is how most uh, uh, sweet ciders are made, because, you know, if you if you just take uh, apple juice and ferment it out, it's it's quite dry, right? Can you talk a little sure. bit about back sweetening? sweetening? Yeah, so you've got a few options that you can play around with uh, back sweetening. So, uh, you know, easy way is you just add more sugar uh, post fermentation. Uh, your sugar could be honey, uh, cane sugar, um, anything sweet like juice, um, apple juice. Even a lot of uh, a lot of the cider makers I started making cider with would freeze some of the apple cider juice that they got um, the day of. And when post fermentation and stabilized, they would back sweeten it with with that fresh apple juice. So the sedimentation, your cider will drop clear even even after you know you back sweeten it up with with some raw cider. It just takes a little time, but all that that sediment in the juice will drop crystal clear. So you can have a brilliantly clear cider mm-hmm. that with sweetness, it can be super sweet, it can be semi sweet. You know that's that's really a preference for for your home brewer or what they want to make and what they prefer to have. Uh, you can carbonate your, your ciders. Um, we did a forced carbonation on, on this passion fruit apple and, um, you can, you can see it's actually stratifying in the, in the glass. So you can see, you know, it's, this as much fruit pulp as is, is wow. in the, in the solution, but I wanted to have a unfiltered hazy juice bomb and it, it tastes like a juice. I mean, I bet it does. <laughs> it, it really tastes amazing to me. And I just love that expression of the passion fruit. And you wouldn't get that without being able to back sweeten it. And so you have to, you know, be careful. Have you uh, explored other fruits uh, in your cider making? Yeah, we've done the cranberry, uh, blackcurrant. Uh, got a strawberry one we're playing around with. Um, a lot of customers, a lot of the bars local want us to make different ciders with different fruits. Been toying with the idea of pineapple. Um, not too much uh, spice wise. You know, I, I, you know, I think you could make a, a, a vanilla cider and, and cinnamon cider like our apple pie pretty easily. But, you know, I don't want to detract from my apple pie mead. So I haven't really gone in that direction. Mm. Ginger, ginger works great. We did a G sting, which is um, a ginger and apple 
Uh, we used ginger people uh, juice. Um, you want ginger in your, your beer, meat, or cider? Look these guys up. You can buy it on Amazon. And wow. it's 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 pureed ginger. Like It comes in a, like a quart jar, and it is significantly more ginger than any any of the ginger I've ever used for anything else in my life. I mean, use, it's, use sparingly, I guess. You don't need a quart jar unless you're making like a 50 gallon batch. You know, <laughs> it's uh, I would recommend maybe a pint size if you're making a five gallon batch and it'll it'll be it's fresh, though. It's the, the ginger just explodes off your taste buds. And um, sounds sounds great. Yeah. It's worth playing with. I, like yeah. so I like to play with different uh, way the spices can get presented, whether it's dried, mm-hmm. whether it's fresh and macerated through a you know, food processor, or in this case, juiced into juice. Um, by far and away, the juice g- ginger is is the most intense flavor of ginger I've ever had um, in in trying to make use it for making fermented beverages, mm-hmm. and I love it. Have you played with uh, hopped ciders? I actually had a couple hop ciders the other day. They weren't <sighs> bad, hard to balance them, but uh... yeah, it's not something I've. I can't see the flavor in my head, right? So I, if, if I can't think of it, I can't really make it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I haven't really gone in that direction. You know, I, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I just, my mind goes to why. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, know, my, my only disappointment is they were, up for the ones I had were a little off balance. They really, the hops was, it was overwhelming the, the, the flavor of the cider itself, you know. Yeah, um, well, it's easy to inject hops post fermentation, right? So you could use right. a Randall or some other device to um, to give hop aroma and hop flavor. But the bitterness is coming usually from the apple, so you don't really need a lot of hop bitterness. And then if you've put in the hop flavoring, you know, through hop thing, then you you're really overwhelming your apple notes. So yeah, I, yeah, and I think beer works better. So I, I don't think it really not so humble opinion. It's not one of my go-to flavors that I yeah, can see yeah, and want to get. Um, well, Michael, where can people learn more about cider making? Well, American Cider Association is a good location to start. Um, they've got a homebrew section as well as commercial. Uh, American uh, Homebrewers Association also has uh, good information. The BJCP has a whole class or uh, co- exam set and and reference rank links for uh, cider making mm-hmm. so there's there's no lack of information what you have to be careful of is avoiding bad information right like and and, and how do you know <laughs> yeah so um read a lot um you know there's some good groups um to, that can help you understand the the various aspects of what trial and error is certainly you know, nothing beats, you know, putting time and energy into it and why does, and take notes and be understanding of what works. Like, you know, you can do single varietal apples into a cider. You can play with blends. You can play with, you know, blending post-fermentation to see if you like that and that and this, and then think about, well, this would, would this work here? Um, a lot of commercial folks that put a lot of time, um, BYO magazine, mm-hmm. um, They've been great um, asking, you know, friends of mine like Jason Phelps to talk and talk about, you know, cider making and, you know, homebrew clubs have been, you know, how I even got here. You know, that's hard to believe now it's 27 years ago, but, um, you know, yeah. I was a much, much younger man when I started and I still try to play like I was young and uh, it shows. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, uh, your, your closing thoughts uh, quickly on cider making. It's worth trying. If you if you think you can make a good beer, you you owe yourself the the challenge to make um, good ciders and and have that diversity in your profile. Maybe some of your friends that are gluten intolerant, and this gives you a way to really showcase um, a different side of your skill set. You know, I'll never forget the time where my bankers said to me, "Well, how can you make beer, mead, and cider?" And I'm like, "Well, it's kind of like asking me if I can make mashed potatoes, baked potatoes, and French fries." Yeah. still a potato you know and so <laughs> fermentation to me is the art set and what i'm fermenting is matters most and the biggest things that i see 
in mead making, cider making, and brewing is cleanliness, like sanitation, and then temperature control. So, it, and your yeast, pitching the correct amount of yeast. So, um, Jamil Zanichev has a Mr. Ye- what the heck's a website? Yeasty. Yeasty. Yeasty something. Um, and, you know, Sergio from Melovino has got meadmaderight.org. So there are ways to calculate how much yeast you need to pitch. And, you know, I've had many a beer and, and drinks with some very famous um, yeast um, purveyors. And um, they, they they really talked about homebrewers and not ever pitching enough yeast to, to really do the job right. And as I watch my brewmaster where we're making a 30 gallon batch by 500 grams of uh, Philly sour yeast. Um, I'm like, wow, that seems like a lot. He goes, well, <laughs> we're going to make a lot of sour um, beers coming down the pipeline. Yeah, and, yeah. and this is a Saccharomyces type of yeast that makes uh, lactic acid. So we'll get that sour flavor. And I got introduced to that. Where the heck was I? I think it was in Europe. Uh, I was in, I think, Warsaw when when I tasted a beer that was made that way, and I didn't realize that was an option. So yeah. my my homebrewing knowledge is is getting less and less because I'm I'm too worried about making you know keeping the the company going and doing the right thing business wise that I don't see all the new stuff coming down the pipeline. But I hope next year maybe I can get back to a homebrew con and uh, get back on stage and present. But you know people ask me what I want to talk about. I'm usually like, well, I'll talk about whatever I want, but yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to think about what people need to hear anymore. Well, I certainly look forward to seeing you again. Um, and, and Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, Brad. And if anybody wants to look at our new farmstead, it's overthemoonfarmstead.com. We're up here in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. It's a, it's a beautiful experience. So come on up and enjoy. Well, thank you again, Michael. Uh, pleasure having you on. My guest today was Michael Fairbrother, uh, founder and CEO of Moonlight Meadery. And uh, once again, Michael, thank you for for taking time to come on the show. My pleasure, Brad. Thank you. A big thank you to Michael Fairbrother for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the new Brew Commander, the brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending brew commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, oil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a brew commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I launched a new version of the Beersmith discussion forum this week, as well as made some significant security upgrades. The Beersmith Discussion Forum is a place where you can discuss all things brewing, including techniques, ingredients, equipment, pro brewing, and of course, our Beersmith recipe software. Join in the conversation today at beersmith.com slash forum. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.